All right, Allison Smith, Director of Generative AI at Booz Allen Hamilton, and Jeff Schaefer, Chief Technologist and Lead of Booz Allen's Responsible AI Practice. So I'm really, really fortunate to have you on today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, before we get to some of the questions, what I wanted to do is sort of highlight the aim, the goal of what we're about to discuss today. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the implications, the considerations, and the possibilities of open source generative AI systems. Um, I'm getting older and older as, as every single day passes, and I'm feeling it more and more. Um, my history goes way back to messing around with Linux and Python way back in the day. Um, PHP scripts and Apache HTTP servers. Uh, Hadoop, I was definitely aware of. Messed around with a little bit, but not as much because it's huge data that I didn't have as much control over back when. And then we had this evolution of TensorFlow uh, and machine uh, learning as well. And now we're in a whole new world of transformers uh, with GPT models um, and then, then a total explosion of what we're starting to see in platforms that, that's going to lead into the conversation that we're having today. So the... The topic that I really want to get into is, is open source that approach, which has traditionally, through what I just talked about, old school technologies that have been around for ages that people have used, whether they would know or not, they've been using these for, for, for years and years and years, for decades. Um, and there's a real honest need and, and importance behind many of these technologies in terms of de democratization of access to the software, ensuring transparency, uh, and improving security for, for many decades. A lot of these things have all come together. Um, but the question is, the question that we're going to try to unpack as we go through this is, is this movement, is the open source movement something that can have a significant impact, a positive impact on AI, or is AI completely and totally different? And we have to sort of look at this a little bit differently. So that's what I'm gonna to try to get into today. But before we do that, let's get a little bit more of an understanding about Allison and Jeff. So could you both please share a bit about your career path and what led you to your current role? Maybe Allison first. Sure, uh, thanks, Joe. I so my background is actually, I, I worked in economic consulting uh, and I have an MBA in finance. And at first you're kind of like, well, how did, you, how did you get into this text processing generative AI stuff? And honestly, it came out of need where I was doing a lot of coding, but for macroeconomic models and things like that. And so a lot of that logic was transferring. And I remember I was at an internship where I was processing lots of text information and trying to systematically do something with this. And I don't want to date myself, but this is well over a decade ago when um, NLP looked more like, you know, bag of words models taking frequency counts on words, right? But it was still some systematic approach to reading a lot of qualitative information. And from there, I was like, well, you know, this is kind of powerful, like you could do stuff with this. And so I did a career switch into um, a more research consulting role, uh, similar to Booz Allen in that most of our clients were uh, federal agencies, but doing a lot of data science, natural language processing work for them. And then I've been at Booz Allen for about five or six years, uh, previously managing our portfolio of work called Cognitive Solutions. And that's where we're taking unstructured information like text, voice, um, even some you know, images and doing stuff with it, right? And so it was a very natural progression into generative models because probably the vast majority of use cases are text-based, although there are plenty of really cool image generation ones. When people are talking about productivity and efficiency, it's largely around language. I love when you brought up bag of words. I've heard someone say that in quite some time. So <laughs> thank you for the old school term. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, could you please uh, outline your general background as well, please? Yeah, it's been a little bit of a, an eclectic journey. Uh, at first it was accidental, then it became purposeful. Um, I started in the intelligence community um, doing counter intel, counter espionage type work. Um, ultimately got into tech strategy and innovation. Um and then made a complete left-hand turn into finance, kind of like Allison. Uh, I was at a uh, large hedge fund, uh, Federal Reserve Bank in New York, was a crypto startup for a little bit back when that was still cool. Um, and then in 2018, I, I, I made a really major pivot into AI um, and was, was really fascinated um, at first by AI policy and those, those types of questions, but um, all of the ethical stuff just really became uh, really interesting. It seemed to have all these nuanced pockets um, to kind of study and dig into. 
it just felt richer. And so I, I, I kind of, you know, chose my major uh, to be, you know, back then ethical AI and, and, and ever since have been focused on, on, on that field. So now, yeah, I lead our, our, our responsible AI practice. Um, our team's mission is, as we say, is, is to close the gap between Aristotle and algorithms and to make things that are more practical, tangible, and useful. And so that looks uh, pretty broad, everything from uh, AI governance to risk and impact assessments um, to increasingly more technical tooling around tests and evaluation and uh, generative AI uh, uh, trust and safety. And so uh, it's, it's it's very broad um, and, and necessarily so because the field is uh, is expanding uh, incredibly rapidly and generative AI has is, is, is only helped uh, to that end. What a great mix. My goodness. Well, it's great to have you both on. I'm looking forward to this. So, all right. Let's start thinking a little bit about open source models and why they are important. So when you both sit down with maybe your customers, your clients, and you start going down the path of, well, there's there's two basic concepts that you can themes that you can go for. And one is is open source, and the other is these kind of walled gardens of sorts. How do you how do you go about describing this and the importance of both and how they could work potentially for those customers? Do you, Jeff, Maybe you want to start with yeah, that go. one? Yeah. yeah go ahead. <laughs> well, well, the first thing I want to recognize is that it's the way that we think about open source and AI is a little bit different than the way that we understand or understood open source as it relates to software. Um, and there are a number of reasons why, if you think about the implications and the original um, intention of open source is to make it really free distribution, have anyone like with a computer essentially be able to create software. And you can't necessarily do that with AI. Uh, and so what we're seeing today, I think, is more of a spectrum. And even though a model may be called open source, for example, it might not be in the most purest sense when you think about software. Like you don't necessarily have the exact architecture, all of the underlying code, the underlying data that went into creating it and things like that. And so that's the first thing we kind of want to educate our clients on. The second thing, if you're just talking about those trade-offs, the biggest one that comes to mind and is probably most important to our clients is uh, the security that comes with using an open source model inside your own environment where you don't have to send data to any organization outside of you to you know, play around with, right? So there's a little bit more control with open source models, um, both in terms of you know, what, how you wanna tweak it if you're going to fine tune it, as well as what it sees. That said, the huge trade-off there is one of cost, not just in terms of computing your own um, inference and running your fine tuning and things like that, but cost of the labor. It takes a lot of specialized people to be doing that for you. Uh, and not all clients have that maturity and they don't necessarily have those budgets. And that's where some of these more proprietary out of the box tools are really helpful. Um, and then finally, as you're thinking about that construct, this trade-off that you're making between the security and sort of the cost and ease of use, um, you really need to think about the specific use case and how risky it is, right? So um, doing a content recommendation on campsites or movies is a relatively low risk use case compared to um, thinking about military strategy, for example. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Jeff, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, I was talking about this with Allison earlier. Last couple of weeks, even, I've, I've been thinking about how the open source um, AI community is, is is evolving relative to, um, you know, the, the, the walled gardens, as Allison said. And I think what we're seeing or what we're going to see over the next couple of years um, is this race to capability parity. And what I mean by that is, you know, very quickly we're seeing these open source models um, be just as, or at least functionally, uh, uh, you know, in the in the ballpark of capability um, relative to an open AI or an anthropic uh, or um, Gemini model. Uh, not completely, but I, I think that difference will matter uh, less and less because I think the difference will become less and less distinct. And instead, what's going to happen is um, we're going to have the user experience and the use cases be the true differentiator for what AI can and should be doing to add value to customers. 
Um, and so I think we're going to see this shift between uh, or shift from talking about just the pure horsepower of a system like ChatGPT relative to an open source equivalent and more about, OK, given this generalized uh, massive uh, power and capability that we have on our hands uh, across the spectrum of models we have access to, um, what's the easiest one to use? And what are we going to use it for? And is it going to work for those use cases? And so for me, what this starts to feel like is we have the greatest intelligence ever created is going to become one of the most basic commodities in the world. Yeah, you know, it's it's amazing to think about the possibilities. It's it's frightening in many ways. We can get to that in a little bit. But so I'm guessing that neither of you are technically a proponent of either or it's just use case by use case. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I, I um, cause each use case is going to re it, it has its own context and specificity. Uh, and so, you know, different models tuned in, in different ways or specialized to the degree that they are in any way, um, obviously are going to lend themselves better to, to different types of use cases. Fair enough. Well, no, so that makes not oh, to please. fully contradict that. Um, but just, that's actually an interesting um, research area right now, right? There's this presumption that the larger the model, the more performance it is. And in general, that is true. So for example, uh, I think there was uh, some kind of test done on healthcare data and they compared the outputs of GPT-4, which is a general purpose, very large language model compared to Google's um, me medical palm one. I, I can't remember which one, but it was, a fine-tuned model specific to medical data and jargon. And they found that the general purpose GPT-4 model actually outperformed it. Mm -hmm. So that kind of begs the question of, okay, we had one hypothesis that if we really fine-tune to a narrowly scoped task, that that model will perform better than a broad one. And it's cheaper, right? And we want it to work because it's cheaper. Uh, and the question is, we're not really sure if that's going to play out because it's difficult to define what these large models are good and not good at, right? It's some tasks we take for granted as humans, like reasoning logic puzzles, for example, are things that are really difficult for these large models. But some very creative tasks that we think are you know, very complex for humans are easier. And, and so it's kind of exploring all these different tasks to understand which models fit better over others. And it's not just um, size and scope even. Yeah, I actually agree with that completely. I, I uh, didn't mean to overemphasize specialization and, and fine tuning either. I, I maybe shouldn't have mentioned those terms at all because Allison's completely right. I think, well, I just wrote about this the other day. What was really interesting in the back half of last year was this budding research showing that uh, simply bigger often can be better and often is proving to be better. And I don't think we fully know why yet, but you know, one of the hunches is that it just has more understanding, you know, in quotations, in context, in quotations about the world. And when we ask an AI system, a generative AI system questions, you know, via our prompts, um, the way human language and the way human reasoning works, the way we ask questions is inherently multidisciplinary. And so the more understanding, more multidisciplinary understanding an AI model has, the hunch is that it is uh, able to better answer those questions um, because it has more to work with, so to speak, versus something like Bloomberg GPT um, that is trained on quite a lot of financial data, admittedly, but a very narrow subject matter indeed. And so that's not proving to be performing. This just came out. It's not proving to be performing better than a more general purpose model. It's really interesting that you both brought that up because I, I've seen this is where it gets kind of zany and we're going to see over time what really starts to to bubble to the top as not the truth, but like what really seems to be tangibly working uh, because I've seen some reports of smaller models actually outperforming some of the bigger models. But I think it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this all works because logically what you both said makes the most sense in some ways. Um, so it's it's going <laughs> to work. I said well, we're still looking into this. We're still trying to figure it out, but uh, uh, more and more case studies are coming out and we'll have to see what ends up happening with that so no great points both of you i really appreciate that um jeff maybe we'll we'll 
twist a little bit to the to the right on this and start looking at the ethical concerns. Um, do you see any with regard to open source versus um, some of the walled gardens, these closed source um, platforms? I think um, I think in, in some ways the answer is TBD. Um, in general, we we think about responsible AI in terms of a formula. We call it the regs formula. So responsible AI equals ethics plus governance plus safety. And so we talk a lot about that equation is going to need to be balanced differently uh, for different AI systems and different applications and use cases. And so you can imagine uh, not necessarily an inherent or fundamental difference between an open source and a walled garden model, but an open source model or a walled garden model being used for this type of use case versus this other type of use case. And the differences between those two, say facial recognition to open up your phone, versus facial recognition for intelligent surveillance, you know, the ethical dimensions of, of those use cases are, are obviously fundamentally different, but the governance of the actual model um, behind them could be quite simple and the safety is gonna be wildly different as well. So those variables are gonna look very different depending on, again, the, the AI system itself and the use case. And so I think it's TBD in terms of whether open source models by their very nature offer any net new or unique risk considerations. Um, I, I think that is a really rich area of study right now. Elizabeth Seeger is, is, is one of the biggest uh, researchers in this space and she's doing really impressive work uh, right now and is, is, is definitely someone I've been following pretty closely. So I think 2024 will probably tell us a lot about whether again, there's a fundamentally different risk posture and profile for open source versus the wall gardens. But I, I don't know if Allison, if you want to add anything or disagree with that. I wouldn't necessarily think of it as they have a totally different risk posture, but I do think that there are some different philosophies and how you think about risk that come from both camps. Even I don't want to like say that I don't want to create this false dichotomy because there are many companies that have both, you know, proprietary and open source options. But, you know, the biggest argument that we've heard for keeping certain models closed is they are so powerful that they pose a risk to the broader population. And so there's this security question uh, to for people and, and how it's used. And if you think about, you know, basic cybersecurity and things like that, we're like, you can't achieve security through obscurity, right? And right. Um, just keeping it closed doesn't necessarily keep it secure, especially with the uh, proliferation of these other open source models as alternatives. When we think about open source models, yes, you do run the risk of bad actors potentially using it for you know bad acts, but at the same time, it's hard to say that one organization can identify all the different risks that a model uh, may face or um, may pose really without testing it um, more broadly with the population, which is exactly what open source models are doing, right? We might not be able to surface how creatively people can use it for bad purposes until they actually do. And anytime you think about new technology, there are risks associated with it, right? Like there's risks to driving a car. Uh, we haven't banned cars, but over time we've had seat belt regulations, we've had airbags included, all of these things that we wouldn't know at the initial design of the car, right? And so I kind of think of generative AI and foundation models in that same vein, and it's easier to do in open source models because more people are using it. I think that's a hugely important point. Um, I, I think, you know, particularly with generative AI systems, we're, we're dealing with emergent behavior. And so by definition, we can't always predict, you know, what those outputs are going to be ahead of time, how a particular model is going to behave, particularly when a human is interacting with that system. Those are two complex entities in, unto themselves. And so when you combine them in a human machine collaboration, uh, you have behavior that, again, you can't necessarily predict ahead of time. And so if you can't predict it ahead of time, you know, we are really emphasizing what we call maximally engaging with the system. So we understand the weird nuanced behaviors, how they manifest, what triggers them, so we can better understand what sort of more generalized control systems we can put in place to protect these models. 
But if we if we're not engaging with them, we're never going to learn, you know, uh, all these all, all their idiosyncrasies. Uh, we're not going to learn the 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 new and novel risks that they might be producing, and therefore how we might mitigate them. And so I think Allison's exactly right on that. And that's a really important point for what AI uh, safety and and, and, and ethical governance uh, should look like. Yeah, and I, and I totally agree with both of you. I think the the idea of red teaming inside of companies is very, very important, but it, they can only do so much. They only have so many resources to be able to do that. So if they were somehow able to open up certain components to the general populace who's going to hammer at these things in the most creative and bizarre ways, I think you have a much more long-term secure um, platform to potentially build out. But you know, it's like, how much do you let out? Who do you let it out to? So it's just, it's one of it's one of those crazy things that you start to have to think about and like, how do we um, curtail as much risk as possible, but uh, help this perform as best as possible as well. All right. I know that we're getting short on time. So there's a few things that I wanted to get to because, and I hope that you're at liberty to discuss. If you're not, I totally understand and respect it, but I want to get both of your perspectives on sort of the alignment problem. Um, and then as it sort of tails into, let's say we don't have, we don't solve that. We don't, curtail where we're directing um, these algorithms to go, uh, that could lead to other issues. So where do you both sit on this? How do we how do we solve the alignment problem? Well, Allison, you, uh, clearly you have the answer <laughs> to the alignment problem. My answer is TBD. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there's a lot of research going into it, right? And, and the first... Um, Kind of knee-jerk step to at least mitigating some possible misalignment is to more narrowly scope your use case and tasks that you're allowing the generative AI system to do, right? Um, potentially at the expense of this world of creativity that it could generate. Uh, and so again, it really depends um, on the specific use case because I don't think when we're working with generative AI today, even though there are conversations about, um, you know, AGI, like, I, I just don't think that is not what I spend most of my day thinking about yet. Um, maybe there will be a day soon when, when that becomes an issue, especially with regards to alignment, because when you have an AGI that's kind of doing um, sort of an unbounded set of tasks, that's where alignment really matters. But for, you know, a generative AI bot that you're saying, hey, recommend the next hotels to me. I mean, does it matter that much if it's a, like a little bit misaligned? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, first of all, the alignment problem is a really good book and I'd recommend that to anyone. And I do recommend that to anyone who joins, joins our team. Um, I think of course, Allison's right. I, I think in addition, it, it is an area of research that I think the Overton window has shifted on, but can still be considered fantastical more so than practical. And I understand why completely, but I, I also think it's it's incredibly necessary. I think our, our research in this space will have to become more creative, uh, will have to become uh, more sophisticated. And I think the, the group of researchers focused on this problem uh, needs to become more diverse. Um, I think it's been, um, really concentrated among uh, AI, a, 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 a section of the AI research community who is really into this problem and has really unique uh, views on it. And, and those aren't necessarily views that we should discourage or dissuade, um, but they are a narrow set of views uh, for sure. And so I think as we look at the future of what the alignment problem is and how we might start tackling it, um, diversifying who is focused on that problem and being more creative about the ways that we can solve that both technically and with more qualitative governance controls, I think is, is it's just a necessary focus area. Very thoughtful. I appreciate both your perspectives on that. That's uh, great to hear. So maybe the final thing that I'd like to talk about, um, better for worse, I, we, I think you've probably been in the same situation, been to hundreds and hundreds of conferences probably. I actually did some survey at one point, I got up to like 500 conferences. I've, I've spoken at it probably a few hundred myself. And there's one in particular that stands out as one of the most jarring uh, sessions I've ever been to. And that was at MIT, I think last year, towards the beginning of last year, where Jeffrey Hinton had just left uh, Google and retired. And he was the godfather of AI. 
And he got up in front of everyone and there was probably 300 people in the room. And he was like, yeah, I'm deeply concerned for where this is all going. Um, not just, and these things are important. Everything we've discussed, you all have, have mentioned the ethics, um, where the data is, all the, the security, every aspect of that is in, tremendously important. But longer term, even some say five to 15 years out, there is potentially something that's far greater that we have to just start to wrap our heads around or at least entertain in, in discussions, even though there's definitely, definitely different camps to this. Um, so when he got up and said that, you know, he's very concerned about where this is all going and there's many other people who have done the same and it's not just for the monetary aspects of this like oh we're further behind um uh open ai whatever the case is there is some thoughtful concern there do you all have perspectives on this in looking a little bit further out than our normal horizon which is probably a few years um anything you'd like to share I'm going to let Jeff start that one. <laughs> I feel like that's an existential question that I'm unprepared to answer. <laughs> I'm an AI optimist. I think by and large at Buzan, we are AI optimists. I think one of the reasons, the core reason that makes me an AI optimist is um, actually the way I think about AI ethics, which is very classical in the sense that, um, you know, the classical philosophers like Aristotle weren't necessarily concerned entirely with the difference between right and wrong. They were more concerned with the question of what, it, what does it mean to live a good life? Aristotle termed this eudaimonia, which roughly translates into uh, human flourishing. And I think we're already starting to see more advanced AI systems being applied to uh, really, really intractable problems in the hard sciences. And I think if we start to knock some of those dominoes down, the, the potential for human flourishing is, is almost infinite. And I think we're seeing this a lot with DeepMind, with their AlphaFold uh, system, having cracked the 50-year the challenge in biology of protein folding and, and what that stands to do for precision medicine, diagnostics, et cetera. Their most recent one, AlphaMySense, and I never know if I'm saying that correctly, for material science, and they're already coming out with net new materials uh, that are being tested. We're seeing AI control better fusion reactors, getting us a little bit closer to the promise of nuclear fusion, which I think will come on and on across the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, et cetera. So the hard sciences is, is, is often the thing that produces innovations and step changes in our technology that most benefit human beings. And I think uh, that virtuous cycle is gonna continue and accelerate. And so for that alone, uh, I'm an AI optimist because I'm a believer that all of the risks along the way will figure out how to solve them. Wonderful. All right. Allison, any any thoughts, final thoughts on this or anything else? I, I like that Jeff is an optimist because I am his complimentary pragmatist. <laughs> um, I, it's not that I am trying to be myopic about this, but it's hard for me to um, appreciate the lack of, or the articulation of this sort of existential threat, like it's going to ruin everything. And it's like, okay, well, what, what, what is that? Is it going to make all jobs go away? Or is it, you know, what is this extreme that we are afraid of, first of all? And the second is, despite that, like, let's suppose even some portion of that happens, I think we're underestimating our ability to adapt to a situation in a positive way, right? Like, um, let's suppose we do lose a lot of jobs. There are going to be other jobs. And yes, there's going to be some friction or some, um, you know, difficulties that happen because of it. But like, is that going to ruin humanity? I, I think that's a little extreme personally. Um, and so the way I view it is is more, it's more of a net positive in my mind, specifically around the things that Jeff was just describing, but also, you know, there's no proof of this existential threat. Like there's just no strong evidence of very specific things that we could never counteract um, with policy, with, with human creativity and thinking in my mind. So. I, I, I would love to talk with both of you for next hour about this <laughs> because I, <laughs> unfortunately I could go down a few different paths with this. And I, I am also an optimist. I have been, I think the world is potentially 
uh, on the precipice of abundance for many people around the world globally with regard to so many different things. But there's also something that's sort of kind of come out of the blue, whatever, in the last year and a half or two that have made a little bit more of a shift that it's it's a bit more of a challenge. So we'll have to see how that pans out, hopefully for the positive, of course. But uh, all right. Well, wonderful. I really appreciate both of you joining today. It's been fantastic to hear all of your thoughts and uh, ideas. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having us.